Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to this time of worship. I know we still got a few people coming in from the donkey procession. A um, couple of quick notes, though, that I'd like to share before we enter into this time. First of all, one that's not in our bulletin, we are going to be having a CPR and AED class um, training coming up on April 26th. That is on Tuesday, April 26th at 10 a.m. at the Georgetown Fire Department. And this is for... In particular, we want to make sure that all of our ushers and all of our security team uh, are trained for that. And I also know that I think Children's Ministry will be bringing some people in as well. It's a $30 per person. Um, Just call the office if you intend to sign up. So just want to pass that along to you. Also want to let you all know that we will not be having our wonderful Wednesdays for the next two weeks. Uh, This coming week is obviously Holy Week, so we won't be having our Wednesday dinner uh, this coming week. And then the following week is spring break for Georgetown County, so we won't be having it on next week either. Uh, There are quite a few announcements, so I'll point you just over to the announcement section in the bulletin so you can see. Uh, What I do want to emphasize, though, is that we will be having special observances this coming week. So on Thursday, we will have our Maundy Thursday service that will take place at 6 p.m. And then on Friday, we'll have our Good Friday service, which takes place at 7 p.m. And that's a service of tenebrae, of light and darkness. Hope you'll be able to join us for that. And of course, on Sunday, we have our Easter services. We'll have a sunrise service at 7 a.m. in the historic cemetery, followed by our 11 a.m. service as well. As I noted last week, um, I do have plants that are available. If anyone would like any plants, they're just out over by the portico uh, that that I germinated. So we have some little seedlings. There are a variety of tomatoes and cucumbers, and probably over the next week or so, I'll be able to get some um, different squash varieties out there as well. So if you like to garden and, and plan to have that ready around Good Friday, Easter weekend, You're more than welcome to go grab as many as you would like. Friends, with all that in mind, let us direct our hearts and mind towards God as we enter into this time of worship together today. There is an insert. I don't have one. It's kind of pale lavender. Yes. The choir will sing the opening part so that you can see the children processing with the palms. And I will uh, direct you to stand for you to sing our glory, Lord, and honor.
Good job. Let us pray together our opening prayer. Almighty God, on this day your Son Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him in the way that leads to eternal life. For in his name we pray, Amen. be seated and I need to bring attention to not something but to someone because last week was a very special Sunday and I did not realize it during announcements so I'm going to do it today but I would like to introduce y'all to Miss Virginia McCarley this is now her second Sunday in church y'all want to show Miss Virginia Precious little angel. And we have a few more of those angels here. So why don't you all, if you are not already gathered with our children, if children would like to come forward and gather with Miss Paula, she has our children's moment for the day. Good morning. I get this mic working. Got it. Good morning, boys and girls. We're doing lots of praise and worship today, aren't we? How many of you were outside for our donkey parade and our praise of the palms? And y'all did such a wonderful job coming in with your palms to the, into the sanctuary. Let's think about something for a minute. When Jesus got to the gates of Jerusalem, or before he went to Jerusalem... Where do you think the donkey came from? Now, the farm? Okay. Well, we know that the farm Miss Mary Ruth has, the donkey came from there. But for the donkey for Jesus, he instructed the disciples to go into Jerusalem and that they would find a donkey there to bring him. So the disciples went and got the donkey. And then the disciples decided that they would put their coats and their blankets over the donkey's body to make it comfortable for Jesus to sit on while he's riding in to Jerusalem. So the disciples played a big part that morning, didn't they? Okay. And who are disciples today? Disciples of the of Peter and John and, and are all the disciples that Jesus had. But who are the disciples today? Do you know? Point to yourself. We are all the disciples for Jesus today. Okay? And so maybe we can't go get a donkey and give Jesus and put blankets on it. But there's some other things we can do, right? What can we do? That's exactly, you, get, you thought of something now? Okay. Friendship. Friendship. 
Wonderful. So we can have a friendship with Jesus, and then we can share that friendship out with others, right? Okay. And everybody had great answers because we can love. And our job is to go out and tell people about Jesus. And that's what disciples do. And we do it by showing our love, by sharing, by telling them about Jesus, by raising our children and our grandchildren to know about Jesus for the legacy and for the story. And so we can all do that as adults as well as children. Okay? So let's bow our heads in heaven. We're going to go into this Holy Week now and remember that we're disciples, okay? And I have another announcement before we close in prayer. Uh, the children, you're going to the gym, parents, the children are going to the gym, and so you won't go across the street, you'll just go back to the gym to pick them up today, okay? Okay, let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Lord, we bless these children, we bless them as disciples to go out and tell about Jesus, we bless their families and the communities that they live, and we bless this Holy Week, oh Lord, as we enter it so that we all can know that we are disciples. And we have second chances just like the disciples did with Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I so enjoy that this part of our service is getting longer because that means that we have more and more kids to wait on as they exit, so that's a wonderful thing. But as they do make their way to their children's church, um, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the ninth chapter of Zechariah where we have our first lesson for the day. Uh, it's only two verses, but pay attention to them because as you'll see in my message moment from now. Uh, these are two important verses for our understanding of Palm Sunday. So the ninth chapter of Zechariah, beginning at the ninth verse. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout out loud, O daughter Jerusalem. For lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foil of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Are there any prayer concerns that any of you would like to lift up this morning as we enter into this time of prayer together? Certainly we trust that our God knows the prayers of our mouth and the prayers of our heart. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we gather today in remembrance of the triumphal entry of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we come today to celebrate the victory that he won. But, O oh God, we do acknowledge that he did not merely enter into the city. Rather, he triumphantly approached victory over sin and death by way of a sacrificial offering. And so we come together to thank you, O oh God, for the gift 
of a restored relationship that this has made possible. For that, for by the power of your love, you redeemed us and brought us into a right relationship. And now our blessing is to live in peace with you. Our blessing is to have hope in the future where we share in your glory. So most gracious God, impart your love into our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. Comfort us, but also move us and inspire us. May we enter into this community with the same confidence of Jesus Christ that's been empowered by your love. Present us with opportunities where we too can serve sacrificially for the good of others. Lord, use us in such a way that people may come to encounter your love through our witness. No matter what we do, O God, we pray that you might be glorified in and through it. Lord, we do thank you for our blessings, especially in the midst of all that we see in this world around us. Know, God, that our prayers remain with those in Ukraine, and especially for the innocent men and women who are being affected, harmed, or worse, watch over them, keep them safe, continue to be with our world's leaders and the leaders of our country, guide them by your Holy Spirit and your wisdom to bring peace. But as we prayed, O God, continue to use us as well that we might be agents of your reconciliation and restoration, that through our witness, others may come to know of your love. For we offer this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. And let us now continue in the spirit of worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
most gracious God, we do give you thanks for these gifts and for all of our blessings. Amen.
I invite you to stand now in honor of the reading of the gospel. From the 19th chapter of Luke, our reading begins at the 28th verse. Now after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage in Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it, as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. And then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road, And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory in the highest heaven. Now some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would surely shout. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I just want to throw this out there. Does it seem strange to anyone that Jesus chooses to ride a donkey into the city of Jerusalem? And I ask you that not in a sense of trying to be funny. I really ask you in the sense of does it seem strange to you that we hear now Jesus has chosen to ride an animal at all? I want you to take a moment and think about all that you know of the life of Jesus. I want you to think of all the stories that you can recall as quickly as you can. From the life and the ministry of Jesus. Do any of those moments that come to mind present Jesus on any type of animal or traveling in any other way than by foot. No. The whole narrative of Jesus and his life and his ministry, we hear that Jesus is traveling from one place to the next. Now, there are a couple of occasions where he does take a boat to cross over the sea to the other side. But the rest of the stories that we hear is of Jesus. He's either traveling from one town to another town. He's either walking uh, to Caesarea Philippi. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee. There's even a story about him walking on the water. There is not an instance where we hear, to my recollection, of Jesus choosing not to walk other than this story. But what we also know is that Jesus descended the Mount of Transfiguration with the intention of arriving in Jerusalem as quickly as he could prior to the Passover. And so we find the story, as it takes on from Luke 9 to the rest, that he's moving hurriedly along his way to reach Jerusalem. And now we get to the moment where he was about a mile outside of the city where he had been trying to reach all along. 
And it's then he chooses to stop. It's then that he chooses to send a couple of his disciples to a neighboring town to find a colt. Now in the Greek, the word colt can also be translated as the young of a donkey. So whether it's a colt or a foil, it doesn't matter. So I'll just use that interchangeably. But he sends his disciples on ahead to find the young of a donkey. And of course they bring it back and we know that he sits upon it and and then he enters the rest of the way. So I ask you the question, why? Doesn't it seem strange that Jesus would choose to ride a donkey into the city? I'm going to tell you a story about my wife. But before I do, I want to say some nice things about her. <laughs> My wife is truly a spectac- spectacular individual. Um, she's a good friend to me and to others. I believe that she is an exemplary mother to our children, and somehow, I don't know how she does it, she is able to manage our house. She's able to uh, manage our children. She's able to take an active role in our church. Um, She's also very much involved in our children's sports program. She even keeps a part-time job within the school system. And in the midst of all that she does, she's very rarely in a bad mood. Rarely in a bad mood. And if she's not, I take credit for probably putting her in a bad mood. (laughs) Jenny is bright, both intellectually and her personality. She's also bold. She has a warm personality. And she loves clothes. (laughs) Very much so. And Jenny and I have a very different approach to getting dressed for any occasion. I go to my hanger, which is about this big, and I look for the shirt that has the least visible stain on it, (laughs) the fewest wrinkles, and that's the one I wear. My wife takes a different approach altogether. It's a wonderful process to watch as it just unfolds. She likes to dress her personality. And so there are few occasions where you will find her when she is not wearing something that is equally as bright, bold, and still has a hint of youthful fun to it. (laughs) A couple years ago, I received an appointment to our second church. And for those of you who don't know, there's a process prior to arriving at your new appointment. There's a formal reception that they have, or really it's kind of almost an interview, um, a formal visit. And Jenny and I were not married at the time that I took my first appointment, so the second appointment that I received was going to be the first time that she got to come with me on a formal visit with our new church. And so Jenny asked me the question, Ross, what do you think I should wear? And I said, hmm, I don't know. Maybe you should dress like other pastor's wives. (laughs) Maybe you could wear something subtle, perhaps a black dress with some pearls. And she came and she gave me this kind of confused and disapproving look. A little while later, she emerged from the room wearing a hot pink dress, a big tassel necklace, some earrings that were probably of an animal or a cheetah or something with a pattern. And she looked at me and she said, I am who I am. They might as well learn from the start what they're getting. 
Jenny dresses to her personality. She truly does. Bright, bold, and happy. And there will be few times that you will find her enter a room when her outfit does not prepare you for what you're about to get. I think Jesus does the same thing with his entrance into the city. He enters the city with a brightness, a boldness, and he enters joyously. And he enters in a manner as to affirm, I am who I am. So while it may seem very strange to suggest this, Jesus chooses to ride the foil of a donkey to make a statement. He chooses this colt. And he chooses to enter riding upon this colt to make a statement to all who are there about his true identity and the real meaning of his arrival. And there are instances uh, in this that we read that kind of point us into this direction to, to kind of gain a better clarity as to why that is the case. Earlier, we read from the prophet Zechariah. I'll remind you of those words where the prophet says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout out loud, O daughter, daughter Zion. O daughter Jerusalem, lo, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foil of a donkey. And I tell you that for those Israelites who were around Jesus that day, they very much would have been aware of this particular prophecy. It would have been very familiar to them. It was written just after the Babylonian exile. And the prophet in these words speaks of a king, one who would be anointed by God, who would rescue and restore the nation of Judah. The prophet declares that a king, God's chosen one, would enter humble and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foil of a donkey. And so we see in this moment what those who were there would have realized as well. That the entrance of Jesus into the city as he has selected it to be resembles the prophecy of Zechariah. He enters upon the foil of a donkey as a humble servant of God whom God has selected to be the one to rescue and restore the Israelites. Now, generally, when we think about this particular scripture, we bring our attention to that word humble. That Jesus, in humility, enters into the city. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, but not to fail to emphasize the other component as well, that he would enter as a humble king. For this entrance is a royal procession. And that's what we must bring and fully understand when we bring our attention to that verse because what Jesus is doing is setting up a moment where as he enters, those who are there realize, though humble, he is royal as well. And, and though Zechariah is the most prominent image in the Old Testament that speaks of this, there are other instances in the Old Testament as well where we see a royal procession similar to this, where a donkey is utilized in this way. One that comes to mind was the day that Solomon would ascend to the throne where his father, King David, the great warrior king who brought the Israelites to a place of prominence and prosperity, on the day that his son was to ascend to the throne, he sent his servants out to collect his mule for Solomon to ride upon as he entered. From 1 Kings, the first chapter, verse 33 
And King David said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon, and have Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, anoint him there as king over Israel. And then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. For those who were there, they would have understood the significance of this royal procession that we see in the Old Testament, but we also see it beyond as well. There's a story, or there's uh, not really so much a story as there is an image that is prominent in Maccabean literature. Now, the books, or the Maccabean literature is really found in the Apocrypha, which is not part of the Protestant Bible. But nonetheless, there is a particular type of scene that is consistent in Maccabean literature that is similar to what Jesus is doing in this moment. The story of the Maccabees is centered in the second century before Christ. It was at a time when the Israelites were under uh, rule by the Seleucid Empire. And the Israelites chose to revolt against this empire. The Maccabees was the family that was prominent in leading this revolt. And whenever one of the brothers, the Maccabee brothers, whenever one of them was victorious in battle, they would ride triumphantly in this manner, into the nearest city that they had overtaken. And one of the most well-known images is of Simon Maccabee. When the Seleucid Empire had been fully overthrown, Simon mounted and rode into the city of Jerusalem in much the same way, to the same shouts and the waving of palms and the same cries that Jesus heard. And do you know the first thing that he did upon entering into the city? He went straight to the temple. He cleansed the temple and he restored it so that it could be used for sacrifice to God. Those who were in attendance would have realized this royal procession that Jesus was on. You see, Jesus chooses this to make a statement. He enters the city in a way familiar to those who were with him, all of them recalling times when God's anointed came to rescue and restore the Israelites. Times that would have reminded them of the history of their people, when they were both prominent and prosperous. The only difference between Jesus and those other figures is that Jesus had not yet won victory, but he would. He would first have to ascend to the cross. And that is something that no one who was there would have expected that day. So my question for you then becomes, Who here needs a victory today? I know you're not going to raise your hand or tell me what it is, but I want to put that before you. Because we're living in a difficult time. There's so much that we carry upon ourselves. Who here needs a victory? A victory that will restore you to a new life a new sense of life, a new call to life, a new purpose to life. The people were eager for a victory that day because life had gotten really hard for the Israelites under Roman occupation in Jerusalem, but also outside of the city. They eagerly received Jesus as God's anointed They received him as the coming king and the waving of palm branches, the shouts of Hosanna, the other cries that we hear that they spoke that day. They all speak back to elements of this royal procession. These men and women believe that Jesus had been ordained to rescue and restore the nation of Israel, to bring them back to a place of prominence and prosperity. 
And so they allowed Jesus access. But they didn't just allow Jesus access into the city. They allowed Jesus to access their hope. They allowed Jesus to access what it is they needed desperately. And the truth is that Jesus would win that victory. And he would win it for them. New life would be restored and made possible to all, but the victory of Jesus would look so far different from what it is that they expected, what it is they were waiting for. And they didn't know how to make sense of it. That's the struggle that we'll have this week as we go through Holy Week. The struggle to make sense out of the victory that Jesus wins for us and the new hope that is given. So my friends, who does need a victory today? My encouragement is for you to claim the victory by receiving Jesus as your king. Allow him to enter triumphantly, not only into your hearts and lives, but allow him to access your deepest pains and your grandest hopes. Know the victory has already been won and is freely offered to you. That victory might just look a little different from what you want, though, or what you expect. But know that the victory is for yours to claim. So make a statement of your own. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand now that we might respond to the Word of God, the affirmation of our faith by way of reciting of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from whom thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In your hymnal, our closing hymn is 278, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
we do look forward to being able to spend time together next Sunday for Easter. Just be reminded that we will have our Easter cross. We'd love for you to come and bring a little flower to put in it. And of course, if you'd like a lily, you can order one before you leave. I invite you now to receive this blessing. O oh, most gracious God, pour out the gift of your Holy Spirit upon all of us gathered here this day, that as we go forth from this place, we might not only go in your love, but that we might go to show your love. In Jesus' name, amen.